Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. On this week's podcast, you'll be hearing from Shelby, Maria, and myself, Crystal. The topic that we will be discussing today is design thinking. Design thinking, as it's found in our design thinking for educators resource this week, is about believing we can make a difference and having an intentional process in order to get new, relevant solutions that create positive impact. This week, we sought to learn more about this lovely little notion and what it actually means for us as scholars and educators. To start today's conversation, we are going to begin by giving a synopsis of the first article, and then we're going to chat about what stood out to us. Take it away, Maria. All right, so this reading is basically a toolkit to help teachers incorporate design thinking into the classroom. It says that design thinking will allow for more fun, getting unstuck, improved collaboration, solutions that fit individual classrooms and schools, more creative confidence, and effective ways to engage students. The the toolkit describes design thinking as being human-centered, collaborative, optimistic, and experimental. And it also says that you can use design thinking for any challenge. The toolkit suggests that educators use design thinking for curriculum, learning environment, processes, processes and tools and systems. You know, what I think is really cool about the whole design thinking thing is that there's some really easy to follow steps for the process. So the first is discovery. Now this means checking out what the problem is and to solve a problem you've got to understand what the problem is. In this step we gather all the information, do research, get together with other people to collaborate ideas, and gather resources, inspirations, and organize what your goal is. The next step is interpretation. So here, you try to make sense of all the information. You should analyze what you know, look for themes, make note of what connections you notice, and then ideation is next. This is the brainstorming kind of step. Now you should be trying to come up with as many ideas as you can. Quantity in this case is valuable. You can refine them afterwards to narrow down what is actually practical and probable. Next up comes experimentation. This means testing your ideas out. Prototypes will allow you to try out your idea and see what does or doesn't work. This lets you get input on what to change. This step may be repeated many times um, to gain more and more information. Finally, the last step is evolution. With evolution, the goal is to improve upon your concept. Here, you'll track data on how your concept is working and use that data to plan your next steps and continue to move forward and continue improving and growing. Yeah, cool, Shelby. Thanks for that rundown. Um, The introduction to this article made me laugh a bit, and it instantly caught my attention. I laughed at the quotes that mentioned that their school's pick-up and drop-off process was chaos. I could definitely relate to that for sure at my school. Um, I work in an elementary school. I thought that they started this article or pamphlet off strong by mentioning that organization systems are stretched to their limits to keep up with all of the changing demands of the times. Teachers are starting to feel stretched to their limits too. I started to go through all the little lesson plans and then I started to become a bit skeptical and disheartened. Um, I thought that in the beginning it was written by a teacher or someone who had direct experience as a teacher and in a classroom. But as I began to read the lessons, I started to think otherwise. The biggest question I had was, how is a teacher supposed to take on this large undertaking when they're eating their lunch at the copy machine or freezing outside during bus duty? After reading all the times each lesson took, which I think were really underestimated, that this is a very long, maybe years long project depending on the topic. I think some projects would have to be led by principals and administration and not by teachers at all. I'm not sure how practical this is for the classroom teacher. Do you guys have experience in schools and what do you think about all this? Um, I also agree that this toolkit seems like a lot for teachers. I do not have experience working in a school yet, but I come from a family of all educators. Um, Both my parents and sister are all high school teachers. So I've seen how busy they are all the time. You know, they're constantly staying late at work to help students or plan lessons or grade papers. And a lot of times they get home and they're really tired. Um, So I definitely understand your point, Crystal, about how this toolkit is a bit overwhelming. Um, 
So I think that if anything, I will take away the concepts and not necessarily all of the um, like exact activities and lessons. And yes, I agree that they could potent that they could potentially take longer than the toolkit estimates. Um, what I thought was funny right away was right in the beginning when one of the teachers directly asks his students for input on the classroom environment and arrangement. Um, I think that this could be a good idea and also possibly a bad idea. Uh, you know, I think a lot of students would have input about sitting next to friends and, you know, stuff like that. If you're thinking in terms of what makes it easier for students to learn, then of course that that's a goal. Um, however, I know a lot of teachers who already do this, you know, they do things like make sure that students who need special attention are seated close to them. They make sure that students who just who distract one another are separated. You know, they make sure that a student with a visual impairment is in a seat that allows them to see what they need to see. Um, I thought it was sort of funny that the reading made it seem like redesigning the classroom environment is a new concept for educators when teachers are constantly doing this. You know, Maria, I totally agree. It definitely seems like something that's just common sense um, to get input from students. But with all the different things we need to know and consider, a lot of times it's the basics that get overlooked. I know that I'm a sub and even just managing the classroom with lesson plans from another teacher, things get kind of out of hand very fast and you don't really have the time to sit down and think about these things or have that extra time to see what a student needs. Um, we also may have very different perspectives and needs from the students that we're educating and what may work for us is not gonna work for them. Um, I think that it's because of this that people forget to ask the students what they prefer. And yes, asking will definitely lead to all sorts of, can I sit next to my friend who I know I'm going to goof off with requests? Believe me, I've gotten that a lot. <laughs> but I think that's all part of the prototyping and testing phase that they're talking about with design learning. If a request doesn't work out, you can always fix it. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I hope people that are practicing this design thinking have some common sense of their own. But with that being said, I did see some things that I thought were beneficial in this guide. I love the point they made out about this process and it being experimental, and it gives educators permission to fail. Educators often feel like they need to be a perfectionist and that mistakes are not allowed. I think this also varies greatly depending on your administration and how your observation process goes in your building. I also liked how everything was laid out and it was easy to follow, including the worksheets and the appendix too. Um, the section that I see as most helpful was the one about brainstorming and especially the page on brainstorming rules. I don't think many people truly know the skill and how to have good brainstorming group etiquette. Um, yeah, Crystal, those are some really good points. I also like um, that they describe design thinking as experimental and say that you should give yourself permission to fail. Um, I think that there is always a lot of pressure on teachers by parents or administrators um, to not make any mistakes. And I think that teachers are often afraid to try new things because of this. Um, so I found it refreshing that the toolkit was sympathetic to teachers in this way. I also like that the reading says that design thinking is human-centered and all about empathy. Um, you know, in a school environment, there are so many different people involved, you know, students, teachers, administrators, parents, and, you know, others. So I like that right from the beginning, it says that in design thinking, you have to think about everyone involved. I also feel like the steps to design thinking are simple and straightforward and can be used for basically anything. Um, so I think that I will definitely try to think about these steps when I'm trying to solve a problem in my classroom. Um, just so that I can organize my thoughts and sort of be more methodical. I'm someone who tends to panic right away when there are issues that need solving, so I think these steps may even help me just to remain calm when I'm facing challenges. Oh boy, Maria, I tend to panic too, and uh, that was definitely reassuring to read. Um, part of being an educator seems to be continued learning, and this ideology really encourages that. Um, if we're trying out new things in the class, there's going to be plenty of times when we fail, but we need to look at it as a learning experience and see how we can use that, um, what we've learned, to do better. I think this mindset is a lot more motivational than the whole, if I make a mistake, then it's the end of the world idea. Yeah, um, I agree with you.
Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to add that I think the collaboration aspect of design thinking is really helpful, especially for teachers. Um, the toolkit talks about sort of forming a team in order to approach a problem together. And I really liked that part of it. I think that teachers can really benefit from working together in that way. Yeah, collaboration is key. It goes back to that old saying regarding raising children, it takes a village. Um, moving on to the second article, so we have time to talk about that. The second one was by Burdick and Willis. And this article started with a summary of the things we learned previously surrounding new media, digital literacy, the notion of digital natives, and even multimedia literacy. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that what stood out to me initially from this reading was the mention of, of abductive reasoning and how it is involved in design thinking. Um, the article, as well as the video we watched, sort of explains that abductive reasoning is one of the core principles of design thinking, as well as empathy. But the abductive reasoning part makes so much sense to me because this is really how we are forced to solve problems every day. Um, the article and video basically describe abductive reasoning as when you have to make decisions before you have all the information. I think that this is usually how people solve problems in the real world. You know, we are often introduced to problems that require action before we really have the time to even think. And I think that this is especially the case for teachers who have to constantly think on their feet. You know, you're right. This reading does do a great job with the explanation of what makes abductive reasoning different from how learning is traditionally done? Um, generally in the classroom, we're given information, um, are told to memorize and analyze it, and then give an answer. But with abductive reasoning, it's a lot less linear and a lot more involved. With abductive reasoning, we don't really have all the information first, and we also don't need to wait around for all of it before we attempt to solve the problem with what we already know. Um, if our solution for it doesn't work, then it's back to the drawing board with new information about what we know isn't the solution. Um, with this method, method um, students seem a lot more involved in the process of figuring out the solution on their own. Yeah, that really stood out to me as well, the abductive reasoning that is. It's how the real, wor real world functions, right? We have police officers, emergency room nurses, mothers, it's naturally done. Um, something else that really stood out to me was the section regarding humanists and this call for them to update their skills to represent their work and findings and not just have their technical staff do it. This call for more of a change in scholarly discourse other than printed text. They also mention that there's a need for more interface development so there's not a force to conform to categories and things made by more commercial technologies. This part reminded me of the section we covered on infographics and how many of our classmates, I'm not sure if you guys were some of the ones, who felt that it was more beneficial to make your own infographic because the templates online were limiting. I was trying to think of other examples that could illustrate this need for design thinking in humanities, but my mind was completely stuck on infographics. Can you guys think of anything else that might illustrate this? Um, yes, I was actually one of the ones who mentioned that I felt like starting my infographic from scratch was easier for me. Um, because the template, the templates just didn't work with what I had in mind. Um, I also felt like it took me more time to create the infographic because I had to design it in Illustrator. But I had a specific picture in my head for it, so it was easier, but it definitely, definitely took me longer. Um, and I think that if I had more experience with different interfaces and working with them, then it, then it wouldn't have taken me such a long time. Um, I also think that this was a good point made in the reading about what we need going into the future. Um, and then it also makes me think about the quest to learn school mentioned in the reading and how their curriculum is based off of game design. Um, the reading says Katie Salen, who is a design professor, says that game design develops abductive reasoning, which I thought was interesting. I'm not sure if I agree that an entire school curriculum should be based off of design you know, designing games, um, but I do see how games can help students develop the ability to think on their feet, so maybe they are really onto something. Maria, I was also intrigued by the school. I actually googled them to find a bit more about them, and I'm going to tell you guys what I found. There's even books actually written about the school. Um, it opened in 2009, and they originally had 76 sixth graders. It also says in the, one of these books that I found that their first semester, these students learn with a bunch of other things, 
how to convert fractions into decimals in order to break a piece of code they found in a library book, to use atlases and read maps to create a location guide for a reality television series, and to create video tutorials for a group of fictional inventors. On their website directly, it also says that with a grant study, they're finding that their 8th to 10th graders demonstrate twice the rate of learning growth Mm -hmm. as college students in categories like critical thinking, problem solving, analytical skills, and written communication. I thought that was really interesting. Wait, Crystal, did you say twice the rate? Yeah. That's, that's really impressive. Um, if that's what the statistics are, then it really seems like it's proven to be a pretty successful program. It's interesting, right? I'd like to learn even more about it and see how these studies progress. Yeah, um, yeah, me too. It, you know, just the concept of a whole curriculum based off of games um, is just really interesting to me. Um, but yeah, in closing up our conversation, I wanted to ask you guys what you thought about one of the quotes in this reading. Um, The reading says that new media educators would agree, along with Cross, that large areas of human cognitive ability have been neglected in education, and as a result, traditional education is no longer a good fit for today's learners. Um, The reading goes on to say that design fills a gap in cognitive thinking capacities, making it not merely an addition to a curriculum, but a foundational component. Um, I have to say that I don't totally agree with this statement. I do think that as technology has progressed, new ways of doing things have obviously come about. And I think that it is necessary for curriculum to change so that students are not left behind with technology. Um, And I also think that adding more design elements into curriculum will help students stay up to date. But I'm not sure that it should be the foundation for education. Um, And I'm also not sure that traditional education is now completely obsolete. Um, For example, I feel like my education was pretty traditional, and I don't feel like I have been unable to keep up with technology, and I don't feel like students today know much more about technology than I do. Um, I wanted to know what you guys thought about this, and if you think education needs to completely change now going into the future. Ooh, good question, Maria. Um, I felt like when I was doing the readings that design thinking comes sort of naturally as students learn more and their curriculum is expanded and built upon as they go up in grades. I think there needs to be more of a shift in the education system rather than completely changing it. I'm not sure if it needs to be the foundation either. Personally, I think that this is all extremely helpful, but I feel like there are other major topics in education that need to be advanced as well, such as social and emotional learning. I'm a bit, big advocate for this. Um, and to tie it back to the abductive reasoning you mentioned, Maria, earlier, I don't think we can expect them to understand this core principle of empathy um, in design thinking with little social and uh, emotional learning skills. You know, Crystal, um, I definitely agree with the naturalness of this style of learning. Um, It would make it a lot easier to incorporate into schools. Um, It seems like the most difficult challenge would be unifying schools to make the shift all along together um, and the chaos that comes with any big change to curriculum. Um, My guess that the best way to sort this sort of change, um, the best way to... mm, Wow, I'm fumbling now at the end. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think the best way to get this change to take place is kind of on a small scale inclusion, like with the Quest to Learn program, um, or even primarily focusing on younger grades who would more easily adapt to this sort of change. To me, though, it definitely seems like it's something that is possible and would be beneficial, but is going to take time to change. And like you said, Crystal, I think there are a lot of other areas in education that need more immediate attention and that need that change now. Um, But I do think this change would be a welcome one as well. Uh, Yeah, I agree that design thinking has the potential to benefit education and, you know, really any field. Um, And I also agree that all of this change will take time. Um, But it seems to me that we are going in the right direction. Wow, that was sure a lot of information about design thinking, but I definitely feel like I understand it a lot more, 
and I will definitely be using it in my future class. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this podcast and that you guys like design thinking as much as we do. All right. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Shelby and Crystal, um, for having this conversation with me. Thank you. Thanks. All right, guys. See you later. Bye. Bye.